I'm Julie Zenner along with Dennis Anderson and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. Duluth's 2021 Housing Indicator Report shows the cost of owning or renting a home skyrocketed over the last year. We will have more on that report. During Women's History Month, we have a story on the What She Said Festival featuring female playwrights and directors at the Duluth Playhouse. And we'll meet the new president of sales and operations of Visit Duluth. These stories and voices of the region coming up on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thanks for watching. And Denny, March is living up to its reputation. What an up and down weather month it's been for us. It has been one of those classic <laughs> months of March. We've had some beautiful summer-like, or at least beautiful spring-like weather, and back to winter again. Yeah, burr. Burr is right, <laughs> yes. All right, well, let's warm up and begin with the headlines. All right, thank you very much, Julie. Wisconsin's newly drawn state legislative maps were rejected by the U.S. Supreme Court this week, sending them back to the Wisconsin Supreme Court for further proceedings. The court did keep in place the new congressional district maps, which were also drawn by the Wisconsin court. The Supreme Court ruling means it is uncertain which maps will be used for the fall elections for the state Senate and Assembly. The unemployment rate in Minnesota and Wisconsin have reached record lows according to the February labor report. Wisconsin's unemployment rate of 2.9 percent tied the state's all-time record low. Minnesota's February jobless rate was 2.7 percent, the lowest number recorded since 1999. The U.S. unemployment rate overall was 3.8 percent. A dead deer in the city of Grand Rapids was found to have chronic wasting disease. That's a first for that deer permit area. The Minnesota DNR says it will update its CWD response plan in the area this spring. CWD has been mostly found in the deer population of southeastern Minnesota. And former Duluth Police Chief Eli Militich died this week at the age of 86. Militich spent 33 years on the Duluth Police Department and was appointed chief by Mayor John Fido in 1982. He is survived by his wife of 61 years, Carol, three children, and many other relatives. The City of Duluth's 2021 Housing Indicator Report released this week has some rather eye-opening numbers. That report shows a 17% increase in the cost of owning a single-family home. And the average price of a rental in Duluth went up about $221 last year. Now those high costs are making an already tight housing market a growing problem for the city. Joining us now with more is Teresa Baida, a planner with the city's Planning and Economic Development Department and the author of the housing report, and Jeff Corey is the executive director of One Roof Community Housing. That's a nonprofit that provides housing services. Thank you both for being here tonight, uh, Teresa and Jeff. Teresa, you, as I just mentioned, you wrote the housing indicator report for the city of Duluth. Does it reveal any surprises? Um, you know, last year was a strange sort of blimp when we saw housing uh, vacancy rates jump to 5%. But I think during the pandemic, we were seeing maybe a lot of college students uh, moving home, uh, folks moving in with friends or family. Um, and so seeing it drop back down to 2% really trends with what we've been seeing out in the community, that it's very difficult to find housing, uh, rental housing, and it's difficult across all income levels. Mm -hmm. Jeff, you've worked in Duluth affordable housing for many years. As you look at the, the key takeaways on this report, what do you think people should really be paying attention to? Well, I think st stem to stern, uh, there's challenges, right? So it's across all of the income levels and the housing types. So, so th that speaks to crisis in, in some regard. Um, I, I, and then I think on top of that, of course, when there are things that are very hard that happen in a community, the folks with the least are the ones who are hurt the most. And so, you know, folks that are working paycheck to paycheck super super challenging to to upgrade their housing or to to find housing and for folks that are that are holding on even um you know with with less resources than that so folks that are either precariously housed or homeless it, it, there's just not much um to to <laughs> to hope for or to to, to see that, that 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 one could better their housing situation so so jeff what is one roof housing doing then to help tackle the housing problem here 
We do a lot of things uh, kind of across the spectrum of housing. Um, so we are devel developing new units. Uh, we finished 42 units last year in the Decker Dwellings Project rental apartments. Um, we've got 52 more planned to start this year. We do single family development or community land trust homes. I think we helped about 20 families last year to purchase homes that way. Uh, we help with home renovations uh, that make loans that banks aren't able to make so folks can fix up their homes. We prepare folks to be ready to buy a house with counseling, uh, financial counseling and sure. education. And then we also work with tenants and landlords to, to, to provide education and mediation and uh, you know, to help people stay housed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so lots of things. Mm -hmm. Teresa, how does the information that's compiled in this report help the city work with folks like Jeff and with other developers to kind of um, make the situation better in, in the housing arena? Sure. I mean, the housing indicator report definitely informs our decision making mm -hmm. and understanding, you know, what the true demand out there and what the market looks like. Um, I think the city has really come together um, with federal, state, local yeah. partners to say, hey, how can we um, help close these gaps? It's really, really expensive to build in Duluth. Um, and so finding opportunities like tax increment financing or, you know, federal funds that just came to the city um, from the American Rescue Plan Act providing 19.2 million um, mm -hmm. for affordable housing projects to really get a lot more units online. Teresa, mm -hmm. the median income for those living in Duluth is $52,000. What's the average rent a person would pay in this city? You know, average rent this year across all unit types. So we're taking, you know, the average rent of Studios One and, you know, putting it into an average. We're looking at about $1,320. That's a lot. You know, that tells us that a great deal of our uh, residents in Duluth are cost burdened. They're paying more than 30% of their income on housing, and that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, COVID had an impact on everyone's pocketbook. Are there some bright spots coming out of it too, perhaps, though, Jeff? I, I know that business has really changed. How people work has changed. And so a lot of companies no longer need the real estate maybe that they did before. Could there be some opportunities for affordable housing and, and maybe some of this commercial real estate that isn't being used right now? There are definitely opportunities in that space uh -huh. and it costs more than one might think to convert it. Really? So, so it isn't quite the slam dunk that you might think, but uh -huh. there's definitely several silver linings. The American Rescue Plan Act funds that Teresa mentioned, that's a, it's going to do a, a, a ton to spur new housing development mm -hmm. and absent COVID, that wouldn't have happened. Is there a, a waiting list for subsidized housing in this city? A, a long one. A long yeah. one. <laughs> it takes several months for somebody to get either to, into public housing or to get a Section 8 voucher. Right. Um, and then if one is lucky enough to get a voucher, making it useful is, is a challenge because the fair market rents are so, so low and that's the amount that you can use a voucher in. I and see. so most rents are higher than that. So it's it, it's very challenging to use those resources now for poor folks. Mm -hmm. Duluth has a very aging housing stock. Um, are a lot of those older homes um, in conditions that they can actually be be fixed up for, for future housing? Or do you see the need for a lot of kind of tear down and, and rebuild? You know, I think our approach is always to say if it's, if the numbers work and we can rehab, certainly. Um, and that's one of our approaches and that of One Roofs to rehab mm -hmm. a lot of these units. Um, but you know, when we run into situations when maybe they're condemned for human habitation, like what resources can we use to raise it and then do some thoughtful infill to maximize on that space. And sometimes instead of just putting a single family, maybe a single family with sure. a attached or detached accessory dwelling unit to ride, you know, extra units. And thank you both for enlightening us tonight. We have to go. Appreciate you being here. Thank Teresa you. Vida, a planner with the city's uh, economic development department, and Jeff Corey, executive director of One Roof Community Housing. Thank you both. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. This week marked the return of What She Said, an annual play festival celebrating female playwrights and directors. Submissions were accepted from playwrights across the country. Producers Megan McGarvey and Isaac Quick sat down with a local playwright and the director that is bringing her vision from the page to the stage. Here in Duluth, we have a very powerful theatrical 
feminine presence and we have a lot to say. <laughs> son grew up around the Playhouse, so I'm very familiar with the Duluth Theatre family, so to speak. But uh, two years ago in November of 2019, my husband died suddenly. And as a form of grieving, I took to writing. And serendipitously at the same time, the Playhouse put out a request for female writing to be submitted for their What She Said Festival. I never in a million years thought that they'd look at what I was writing, and really what I was writing was more therapeutic than anything else. But I sent it in and it got chosen. It's a monologue. It takes you through all of the emotions. It's about a woman contemplating her relationship with her daughter. And as you can imagine, mother-daughter relationships can be very emotional. And I think the, me the piece itself uh, sends a message to the greater audience of making sure that you, you know, say the things that you want to say and communicate how much you love them and how much you care about them and how proud of, you of them that you are. I think it's rather a dark piece and uh, it's, it's very personal and very emotional. But there's also, I think, a really important message in it for young women and young boys as, as well about um, self-esteem, self-value, self-worth. And uh, that's the message that I'm hoping that it portrays. This particular story, especially being part of an all-women directorial, a lot of the um, actors are women, it, that the festival is about women, I feel like this piece in particular is so powerful because this relationship out of the script and connect it to our own relationships with our own mothers uh, or with our own parents. and. And I think that's why this piece in particular and all the other pieces can be so powerful. It is important to have women in roles directing, stage managing, and acting because most of the movies that you see, a lot of the plays that you see, a lot of the musicals that you see, they're all written and directed and the lyrics, uh, the music is composed by men. Women have a lot to say too. Uh, women have a different creative tone and they can bring a lot of depth and beauty and grit to a piece. We all know that in theater, small town to Hollywood and everywhere in between, female voices have not been center stage, pardon the pun. And so to see the Duluth community offer something like this on a national scope and reach out nationally is such a good feeling. I love telling people in all of the big cities and on Facebook that I live in, in what I think is one of the strongest theater communities that I've ever seen and ever lived in. And the fact that they would bring about a Women's Voices Festival is just amplifies what we have to offer here. We know that women's voices have been squelched. We know that. We all know that. And so this is a great opportunity for those of us who think we have something worth listening to to say, hey, what about me? And and if this story can resonate with, for me, if this can bring me to tears, if this can bring me to laughter and joy and heartache, then I gotta believe that it's gonna touch somebody else, right? I can't wait to see the other four pieces, right? I have no idea what they're about. Um, but I know that if those four women wrote from the place in their heart that I did, that we're gonna see some incredible, incredible work.
if you are interested in catching the What She Said Festival, it's not too late. Visit the DuluthPlayhouse.org for more information. Visit Duluth, the local organization that markets Duluth as a tourism, event, and trade show destination, has gone through some big changes over the past year. Now this month, Visit Duluth's board of directors named a new leader for the revamped organization. And so joining us now is Daniele Vila, president of sales and operations of Visit Duluth. Daniele, thank you very much for being here tonight. I, I want to start off by asking, what focus are you bringing specifically to Visit Duluth that maybe that organization didn't have before? So thank you so much for having me here. It's really nice. And um, one of the perspective that probably the board see in what I can bring here to the you know, association organization, the city and all the area, probably a little bit like of uh, experience that I had over the past uh, few years uh, working in Italy, working in Europe. I work also in Dubai, you know, doing exhibition and, uh, and, uh, and meetings and conferences there. So that's a little bit of perspective, like what's out there, what can we do differently, uh, what can we do better? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What attracted you to this position? But that's what I've been, what I've done mm -hmm. for the last few years. I like the industry. I like the leisure. I like the hospitality. I worked in a theme park. I work in a marine in Italy. I work in exhibitions, uh, convention center in Italy and Dubai. And it's a business I do like. I do like because it's uh, uh, changes all the time. It's never the same. You host different businesses, different industries. You meet so many different people. It's really engaging. You work, uh, you know, days, nights, weekends. So it's <laughs> really energetic. Mm -hmm. Duluth has become quite the convention site for many organizations, not only in Minnesota, but out, out state as well. What is it that makes Duluth a premier location for a convention? Because Duluth is such a unique uh, uh, area. It's a, like a really nice big small city with so many things to offer for visitors and uh, businesses coming to Duluth. Imagine like a big conference, they come here, you have the delegates coming to the job for a couple of days, they can come here with the significant others uh, so they can enjoy what's the beauty, whether it's winter or summer, there is always so much to do and if you're not used to this one, you can really actually can enjoy ice fishing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're pretty new to the, the community and to the job, but do you have a, a sense yet of where you would like to really focus some of your energy, um, the, the types of events or the types of conferences that you think would, would be a really good fit for this community? So the way now that we are working uh, with all the changes that happens in Visit Duluth and in the city, we're gonna be like really moving forward like an army because it's gonna be Visit Duluth, it's gonna be the city of Duluth, and the marketing agents, Mel Belmont, that have been selected and uh, managing. So they're gonna be focusing more on the leisure side, mm -hmm and uh, we are going to be focusing more on the B2B side, so trade show, convention, meetings, and sport events. So we are going to be tackling those kind of business, those kind of markets. Of course, accordingly to the you know, uh, capability of the route, we are not going to be able to host a 10,000 you know, delegates event because we are not room available, mm -hmm. transportation, restaurant. So we are going to be focusing on the uh, meetings and events that we can bring to the route and maybe one that has not been here, and maybe international, why not? Mm -hmm. When you're doing your marketing, you're out and about in various cities around the region, what are you telling the folks in those, in those markets about the city of Duluth? Uh, Duluth is great in, in terms of hospitality, reception. We do have an international airport. Logistic transportation is easy to reach. There is so much to do also in terms of, uh, you know, activities once you are done with your work uh, or as I was saying before, we, you know, people coming with you. Sure. And those kind of attractions, they don't come, for, they, I mean, they don't take them for granted, you know, in the majority of other cities. Mm -hmm. You mentioned international. Um, are there international connections that you have that might lure some people to uh, to bring a convention? To I will for area? sure gonna be knocking on all the <laughs> doors that I know and all the people that I know. The organization, like uh, you know, international. There are all like, of course, like nationwide in U.S. But I will for sure be knocking on all the doors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we only have about thirty seconds, but yeah. there's plans for a new visitor center. In Canal Park? Absolutely there is. We're going to be opening the new visitor center in a month or so. And so it's going to be a fantastic location, very new design, good vibes, and perfect for the visitors. Super. Can't thank you enough for being here. Daniele Vila, thank new you. president of sales and operations for Visit Duluth. Thank, thank you, you for again. having me here. Thank you. Thank you.
It's time now for Voices of the Region. Each week we hear from a journalist covering stories of interest in the Northland. This week our reporter is Aaron Brown, an author, columnist, and instructor at Hibbing Community College. We're going to see a series of very competitive elections on the Iron Range. In fact, I wouldn't even be sort of, you know, underselling it to say that the control of the Minnesota House and Senate might rest on the outcome of some Senate races and House races just right here in the Arrowhead region in northeastern Minnesota. So that's a very exciting detail for political watchers. Um, there are a lot of policy implications, uh, big picture policy implications. And, uh, and a kind of a cultural vibe, I think, at, at, on the line here, uh, there, a lot at stake. And so one of the big dominoes to fall was uh, State Senator Tom Bach, former minority leader, former majority leader, uh, former DFLer, now an independent caucusing with the Republicans. Uh, he, he announced, um, perhaps surprisingly to some, um, not to others, he was going to retire and, and uh, leave his seat, his new district uh, seat open. And that's, uh, of course, significant for a lot of reasons. Senator Bach had among the highest amounts of seniority in the range delegation. He had uh, been either a chair or a caucus leader, which is, a, which is a high ranking position in state politics for a long time. And now uh, he will be replaced by a new senator of one party or the other. That's also reflective of the district being split between a very big geographic area, the, the more rural wooded part of Northeastern Minnesota, stretching from Cook County all the way to Lake of the Woods and all the way down through the wet, uh, Eastern Mesabi Iron Range. And then uh, that's the 3A side. And then the 3B side is, is Hermantown Proctor and uh, what you might call the Duluth Exurbs. And uh, so that's, those are two very different house districts uh, merged into one big Senate district that will be one of the pivotal Senate races of the whole state. Growing up, and you know, this is true of a lot of people, perhaps who grew up uh, on the range and in rural places and places where there weren't a lot of money, uh, your mom made your clothes. My mom made my school clothes when I was a kid and my sister's clothes. And uh, that wasn't terribly uncommon. But uh, analysis of product costs and prices now, we talk about inflation a lot in the news these days. Um, it shows that it's actually not cheaper to make your own clothing from scratch uh, than, than it is to buy the cheap clothing that comes usually from overseas and usually from people who don't make a lot of money, who make less than poverty wages here. Um, uh, and so this is a question that we have was we talk about prices a lot because we notice paying more for the products we use every day. But I don't know that we have a really good, as a society, relationship with the value of the things that we use every day, the value in terms of what they cost to make and the work that goes into making them. Um, one of the challenges, I think, especially in, a, in an advanced democracy, an advanced uh, capitalist industry like, like the United States, you want to uh, figure out how we're going to be self-sustaining into the future. And right now we have a population where not only do not, a lot of people not know how to sew clothing, I, I'm one of them, to be honest, um, but even if we wanted to learn, um, the, the, the fact that it's more expensive is actually a deterrent to learning how to fix your own cars, how to fix your own, uh, how to make your own clothing. And so that's something that we need to think about. What are the, what, not only what the cost of what we're paying for things like gas and, and what we pay at the grocery store, but also the, the value and also the, you know, the value and, and cultural value of being able to produce our own things. I am here at Hibbing Community College in my office, and uh, in a few months, I will be at the Hibbing campus of Minnesota North College. So five colleges, Hibbing, Misabi Range, Rainy River, Vermilion, and Itasca are all merging and uh, Mesabi Range has two campuses. So we're actually going to have six campus locations uh, for Minnesota North College spread throughout Northeastern Minnesota. Um, the, 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 short, you know, the short reassurance we can give everybody is that all the campuses are gonna remain open and will function much as they have before. 
and the programs and courses and instructors and, and support staff that you've come to know in your local community will remain available. Uh, but the merger does open up new opportunities and uh, obviously it produces a situation where we're more financially resilient. That's one of the reasons it happened. But, but also it's um, going to allow students to register on multiple campuses if they so choose. Uh, it allows students change to change directions and, and without having to transfer or go through complex bureaucracy, um, they can switch from one campus to another if they want to try a different program. It's got a lot of flexibility for the student. Well, that's our time this week, but you can stay up to date by following Almanac North on Facebook and Twitter. Visit the WDSC website for program updates, news about the station and upcoming events, and download the PBS video app to watch your favorite PBS programs on demand. Well, Denny, I'm still waiting for March to go out like a lamb. You and a lot of other <laughs> folks. <laughs> I think everybody's ready to say goodbye to the month. Hopefully it won't be too bad. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to our guests and the crew here in the studio with Dennis Anderson. I'm Julie Zenner. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next time.